Before we get into the message today, I just want to uh, actually think a moment about the new year coming up on us and something that just kind of started accidentally uh, has kind of gained some traction, so I just thought I would share it this morning. Uh, I was just thinking about myself that I wanted to read through uh, the Bible chronologically. I'd never done that before. There's a thing called the chronological Bible that puts the Bible in the events um, as they actually happen. And so I'm going to do that and I mentioned it on Facebook. Several people seemed interested in uh, doing that too. So I started a Facebook group uh, that's called TCCC Through the Bible in 2022. And so if you'll look for that, uh, that will be a neat little way for us. There's daily readings in that Bible. There's a link on that page to the Bible that I'm using so we can be reading the same thing uh, each day. It might not be for everybody. You might, you might think, I don't like to read that much. Uh, you, I'm, you're more of an audio Bible guy or whatever. But it's, this is a great way to get in the Word. They say in like 15 to 20 minutes a day, you can read through the entire Bible in a year. And so again, that group on Facebook is TCCC Through the Bible in 2022. If it's something you're interested in, you can find the link on there to the Bible that we're using uh, for that. And we'd love to have you join us. Um, I'm not a good gift buyer, and uh, if my wife's here, she's probably thinking amen right now. Um, I struggle with the whole gift buying thing, and I usually put it off because I don't know what to, to get, and uh, so I, I usually ask what everybody wants, and they always say, nothing, no, don't give me anything. Well, that's not helping anything, um, and so I searched online for uh, some of the most thoughtful gifts that people had received. And some of these people are knocking it out of the park. Like this one lady said that she and her sister filled a huge jar with 365 memories, and they called them Remember Wins, for their parents. And so each day their parents for the next year could reach in and, and pull out a Remember Win and bring back great memories that they had. That was a pretty thoughtful gift. One lady had a dress shirt of her dad turned into a skirt uh, to give to her daughter as a keepsake of her father. Uh, another person received a cutting board that was engraved with a favorite recipe that was written, uh, just as it was handwritten uh, by her mother. And uh, one guy gave his wife a Spotify list of all the songs that he said made him think about her. Now, back in the 80s, we called that a mixtape, right? <laughs> but... Uh, we wouldn't get by with a mixtape back in the 80s, but, but apparently that's what worked. And one man got a set of cufflinks with the GPS coordinates of the place where he and his wife shared their first kiss. That was a pretty thoughtful gift. So there's those ideas. If your wife or your husband's not watching with you today, that might help you out a little bit. Uh, I also did an online search for the strangest gifts that people had ever received. One person was gifted with a, a complete set of prepackaged ham, including ham steaks, which I've, I've never had a ham steak. Have you all? Is that what spam is? What is spam, anyway? Another person reported receiving a box of laxatives for Christmas. I wouldn't recommend that one. Uh, a man in Hawaii reported receiving a Bob Ross energy drink. Bob Ross did have a lot of energy, if you think about it. And one person said they got a toaster that looked like the Death Star from Star Wars. So if you've got a Star Wars fan, look for that online. You can get that for them for, for Christmas if you just want to go the bizarre route. But today, I tell you all of that because I came to tell you about the uniqueness of the gift of Christ that we received at Christmas. Why is Christmas the celebration of the most unique gift that the earth has ever received? Uh, Jesus means a lot of things to a lot of different people. For example, Muslims in the world, they believe in Jesus. They just believe him to be a prophet among other prophets and not on the level of Muhammad. They see him as a lesser prophet than Muhammad. Uh, Hindus regard Jesus as a, a guru, as they would call him, or a great teacher among other many other teachers. Um, some on the more maybe liberal end of Christianity say, well, Jesus is a great example of a moral person and a positive example of a good human being, but they don't embrace the whole Son of God, only way to heaven, and some of these other things that are taught in Scripture. Well, during this Christmas series of messages, we're going to look 
at the heart of Christmas. Who is Jesus? Why is he a unique gift? What did he tell us about himself and his mission in coming to this earth? And I think you'll find in this series, he truly is a gift uh, like no other. The first reason that Jesus was a unique gift to earth is because he existed before he was born. Now, not a lot of people can say that. Before Jesus became a man and walked upon the earth, he already existed in heaven as the second person of the Trinity. And Christmas is a celebration of Jesus' birth, we say, but actually it was just his physical birth uh, into the physical realm of the, of the earth. But he always existed as part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke about his own pre-existence even before the creation of the world. In John chapter 17, it says, And now, Father, glorify me, Jesus says, in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. Now, this is just one of many references that Jesus made to his pre-existence before his earthly birth uh, in Bethlehem. Each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each introduce Christ in a slightly different way. Some of them focus more on the birth. Some of them go back further than that. Matthew begins with a genealogy, and he really bears down on the lineage through, through uh, his earthly parents to show that he is a descendant of David in fulfillment of the prophecies. Mark tells about John the Baptist preparing the way. He starts with Jesus' baptism and temptation and then goes into his ministry. Luke, in his account, starts with John the Baptist and then goes into the events of Jesus' physical birth. But the Gospel of John probably goes back the farthest because it talks about Jesus' pre-existence. And it says that he existed as part of the Godhead before the creation of the world. In John chapter 1, he begins this way. In the beginning was the Word. And he's referring to Jesus here. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. There are a number of scriptures that indicate that Jesus not only was with God before the creation of the world, but that he was the primary agent of the Godhead that carried out the creation of the world. John goes on in verse 3 and says all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made Hebrews chapter 1 says in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world Colossians chapter 1 says for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together wow not only was Jesus in existence before that night in Bethlehem but he was the creator of the universe uh, he was that agent through whom the the heavens and the universe was created on various occasions in Scripture Jesus talks about having come down from heaven, meaning that he existed prior. In John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So that makes him a unique gift. He existed before he was born. Well, then Jesus, second of all, was a unique gift because he was born of a virgin. A 2017 poll revealed that 66% of American adults say that they believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Now, how many of you that was higher than you would have figured it would be? 66% of people believe in the virgin birth. It actually it surprised me a little bit, but it's actually down from previous years. It's trending in the wrong direction. And you know, as the Christmas season approaches, you're going to see more and more on television and in the secular media about Christmas. And some of these channels will explore the claims of Christianity in a very negative light. Uh, news outlets and other media sources often seem to be surprised that so many Americans believe in something as unscientific as the virgin birth. And they scoff at it. One New York Times writer even said, 
the faith in the virgin birth reflects the way American Christianity is becoming less intellectual and more mystical over time. That's the world's opinion of the Christmas story. For the secular world, the virgin birth is just too supernatural to be believed. Nobody takes that seriously, a virgin birth. Some liberal theologians today, bending to this sort of mentality, have begun to argue that really the virgin birth doesn't matter. He might not have been virgin born, but you can still believe the other things about the Bible. I disagree with that. I, I'm here today to defend the virgin birth of Jesus. I, I, I contend that it is an important doc, doctrine of the church. Uh, several years ago, talk show host Larry King, when asked if he could interview anyone from all of history, who would he like to interview? And Larry King, which I'm not sure of his status, if he's a believer or not, but he said uh, he would like to interview Jesus Christ. And so the, the person asked him, uh, what would you ask Jesus Christ? And Larry King said, I, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. And the answer to that question, Larry King said, would define history for me. You see, that's a hinge point. The virgin birth of Jesus. Even Larry King realized this. If it's true, and I do believe with all my heart that it is, it's one of the many proofs that the gospel of salvation through Christ is more than just a story we tell at Christmas. It's the absolute truth. It's the reason for our hope. The doctrine of the virgin birth is plainly taught in Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was one of the prophecies of the coming Messiah that for centuries the Jewish people were waiting for. It had been hidden in those, not hidden, but revealed in those scriptures for centuries. And we often read one of those prophecies in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin birth, if you think about it, shouldn't be denied because it's supernatural. It should be paid attention to and it should catch our attention because it's supernatural. Because if, if, if Jesus were born in the same way that any other person on this earth could be born, then how could he claim to be something more than just another person? But the prophet said, no, when the Messiah, the Savior of the world, arrives on the scene in history, he will be born in an unusual way born of a virgin and when God puts his fingerprint of the supernatural you know that he is, is working in a great and mighty way both Matthew and Luke's gospel accounts note that Mary was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus to confirm what the prophets had said Matthew 1 says now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit and Matthew goes on to tell how Joseph he wasn't believing this whole thing about a virgin birth yeah right how dumb do you think I am Mary thinking that she had been unfaithful to him and he was ready to to break off this engagement which would require something similar to a divorce in their culture that day. But an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph to confirm what it would be hard to believe otherwise and said, no, she really is a virgin. This child within her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And so Joseph agreed not to put her away, and he married Mary. The virgin birth is the core piece of the account of Christ's birth. The virgin birth is the divine evidence of the Messiah's identity as chosen the part, as part of the plan of God. So yes, belief in the virgin birth is a key part of our belief in the Christmas story and the very gospel itself. Now, what about the doctrine that, of, of Mary's perpetual virginity as has been taught? Uh, what this means, uh, the official doctrine and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is that not only was Mary a, a virgin when Jesus was born, but she remained a virgin for her entire life. Now, I'm not here to, to pick fights among denominations and so forth, but I do think it's important from time to time that we look at what we believe and how it's different sometimes from other faith traditions maybe you have come to this church from. Uh, 
the Catholic Church views Mary as the mother of God and the, the, the queen of heaven, sometimes she might be called. They believe that she was exalt, has an exalted place in heaven with the closest access to Jesus and God the Father. And so uh, prayers are often uh, lifted up to Mary. And the thought of her having uh, relations with a man would be offensive and perhaps even blasphemous to them because of this exalted place that they put Mary in. So what does the Bible say about this doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary? Well, in Matthew chapter 1, we, we get a, our first clue. It says, when Joseph woke up, as did, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, I'm not a detective, but I think you can see an important word there is until, and the implications of that word. Furthermore, the Bible speaks of Jesus having brothers and sisters. In, in Matthew 13, it says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So in other words, people were saying, this guy might be the Messiah. But the people that grew up around Jesus are going, he's not the Messiah. We know him. We know his mama. We know his dad. We know his brothers, his sisters. We grew up with him. Our kids played together. He's nobody special. right? That was their view. Now, in fairness, uh, our Catholic friends will often point out that the Greek terms for brothers and sisters used here can also be used to extend to mean extended family members like cousins and nieces and nephews and so forth but in the context of the scripture the implication seems to be pretty clear they thought Jesus to be the biological son of Joseph and Mary now they were partly right uh, he wasn't the biological son of Joseph and they seem to be stating that they also believe he is the brother of James Joseph Simon Judas and his unnamed sisters in this passage these folks are saying, we know him. He's very familiar. We know his whole family. Yet there's another account of, of Jesus' siblings as well being mentioned in conjunction with his mother Mary. In Matthew 12, it says, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Now, if they were merely Jesus' cousins, why are they always mentioned in conjunction with with Mary now you might be sitting there thinking why is Greg worried about this what what is the whole point of whether uh, she was perpetually a virgin or not because it, it has to do with how we regard what are we to do in a biblical context with Mary it is indeed an honor that Mary was the woman chosen to give birth to the Son of God blessed is she among women she's highly favored by God and she should be respected but the Bible does not tell us to pray to her. Uh, Jesus is our one mediator. The scripture makes it clear that when we pray, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus through our one mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So he's a unique gift and that he was virgin born. And he was earmarked by God out of all the people in history that the one person in all of history born of a virgin is the one sent by God to save the world. Thirdly, Jesus was a unique gift because he was the son of God in the flesh. Christmas is a celebration of what is often known as the incarnation. Now, that is a, a church word that maybe uh, begs to be defined a bit. And I always like to take an opportunity to take some of these church words or biblical words that we're not as familiar with and make sure we have an understanding so that when we hear it sung in songs or uh, as we read the Christmas story, we know what it's talking about. The word incarnation means the act of being made in flesh. And John chapter 1 goes on down in verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth you know if you stop and think about this gift 
And the true wonder of Christmas is that the glory of God came down, put on flesh, and dwelt among us. Try to get your, your mind around that. No other religion makes that claim. I think people miss the wonder of Christmas when we fail to stop and really consider the incarnation. On Thursday of this week, as I was working on this message, uh, I had been over here doing something and was walking back through the student center on the other side, and John was in there, and about the same time, we realized that a bird had flown, gotten into the building somehow. He starts flying around, and John was running around screaming like a little girl. I mean, it was, that's not exactly, not exactly true, but I would like to pull the camera footage and watch. Because we're both in there trying to get this bird out of there and we opened up doors and we're just trying to, trying to shoo him out or her out or whatever it was. And we finally did manage to get the bird out safe and sound. But that, that whole thing reminded me of a story that Paul Harvey told years ago. And I, it just seems too odd to be coincidence that that event happened this week in context of this message. Paul Harvey used to tell... A story about a man who, who told his wife, he said, it was Christmas Eve. He said, I'm not going to that Christmas Eve service. He goes, you all go on if you want to do all that. I just don't see the point in it all. Well, the family, the mother took the kids and she left and they went to the Christmas Eve service. He sat down by the fire and began reading his newspaper. When suddenly he started hearing a, a thud up against the window. And so he turned and he looked and he saw that it was a bird or, or actually a couple of birds that were flying into the window and it was cold and snowing outside and the wind was howling and it was so cold. And this guy, he was an animal lover and he felt bad for these poor birds trapped out in the, the cold. And so he thought, you know what, if I could just get them into the barn, they can roost up in that barn out of the wind and, and get warm. And so he, he went outside and he he opened up the door to his barn nearby and he turned the lights on inside the barn and, and thought they'll see the lights and they'll go in there. But he waited and they never did. Well, then he thought, well, I, I'll take some breadcrumbs. And he took the, the crumbs from the bush outside his window where they were and he dropped the crumbs all the way up to the barn and thought, well, they'll start eating those and they'll make their way to the barn and they'll figure it out. But they, but they didn't. And he realized, well, they're just afraid of me because I'm so much bigger than them. And I, I'm intimidating to them and seem to be a frightening creature. He thought, if only I could just think of a way to get them to understand that I'm trying to help them so they'll trust me. He thought, if only I could just become a bird for a little while. I could, could mingle with them. I could talk to them. And I could show them that they can trust me and that I'm trying to do good and to help them. I could speak their language. At that moment, he said, the church bells began to ring from the Christmas Eve service where his family was. And he said, he, he thought about what his family was there celebrating. Celebrating the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, the one who put on flesh so that he could come down here and walk among us and talk to us face to face and show us that he is for us and not against us. And he came to build a cross from our sins to the holiness of God and to take us to a place of safety where we wouldn't have to suffer for the sins and the misdeeds of our past. If he could just become one of us, he could point the way. It said that as he heard those bells ringing, he made the connection and he fell to his knees, finally understanding once and for all what a gift Christmas really is. You know, in coming to earth in the flesh, Jesus, the scriptures say, he took, on, he took on the image and he showed us the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15 says it like this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You see, through Jesus... Since the incarnation, mankind was allowed to see with his own eyes what God is really like. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They could experience his heart of love and compassion firsthand, like the woman at the well, like the woman caught in adultery. and She felt the kindness and compassion of a loving God. They could witness his great power on display through the miracles that he performed. 
like the disciples who were aboard the boat when Jesus stood up on the bow and he spoke and the winds died down and he calmed the sea with just the mention of his word. Or those in attendance when he, he spoke into a, a grave and Lazarus came forth still wearing the grave clothes. They got to see the power of God firsthand. They could hear his wisdom and the truth of his teachings as he taught the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And he connected all the dots and showed them the spirit behind what God was trying to accomplish in his kingdom. A minister friend of mine shared that the King, King James V of Scotland would from time to time lay aside his royal robe and he would dress as a common man. And uh, people wouldn't recognize him. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, that show about undercover boss. You ever seen that where the boss, the head of the whole company, disguises and comes down. It's kind of in that same thing. The, the king of Scotland would dis, disguise himself and go out among the people and he would meet people and talk to them. And he got to see firsthand the difficulties and the hardships and the sorrows that the common folks faced by entering into the world of their daily lives. The king of Scotland said when he returned again to sit upon his throne to put back on his royal robes, he would better be able to rule them because he understood from their perspective with compassion and with mercy. It reminds me of a passage of scripture that tells us something very similar about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4 it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, church, I'm thankful that because of the incarnation, that when I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, I have an advocate who says, Father, I know what temptation's like because I faced it. Would you hear Greg's prayer? And when I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, I have an advocate, I have a high priest that says, Father, I know what it's like to feel lonely. I know what it's like to be in, in emotional anguish because if you remember, God, I, I prayed to, to, in, in such anguish that I sweat as drops of blood. I'm thankful that I have a high priest that understands the sorrows and the griefs of this world. Because of the incarnation he's walked in our shoes he knows what we face he knows what it's like to be tempted he knows what it's like to be persecuted for doing what's right he knows what it's like to carry a cross of sacrifice for the glory of God we have a high priest who truly understands our burdens and cares and leans in when we pray why was the incarnation necessary why was it a necessary part of God's plan of salvation? Well, first of all, the scripture tells us it was necessary that Jesus be born under the law. In Galatians 4, 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, there's the human element, born under the law. Now, no one in the history of mankind born under the law has been able to keep it. Now, we all like to think of ourselves as being pretty good people. And I know you all, and by my standards, basically everybody in here, you're a good person. But that's not the basis of our salvation. None of us can keep the law perfectly. And if that was the basis of whether we get to heaven or not, we're all in trouble. Jesus, though, was born under the law as you and I have been. And he came and he fulfilled it perfectly. Although he was tempted, he never sinned. He and he alone can stand before the Father and say, I'm not deserving of punishment. And at the cross, he came to credit his righteousness, his perfection to our account. See, Galatians goes on in verse 5. He was born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now that leads to the second reason Jesus had to be born in, in the flesh. A blood sacrifice was necessary for that transaction to take place. 
in order for me to receive the righteousness of Christ and for him to take my guilt upon himself, blood had to be shed. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's why for centuries under the old covenant, it was about animal sacrifice. That the, the blood of the innocent had to be shed for the guilt of the offender. And God was letting us see that over and over so that when we finally receive the Lamb of God, we would understand the connection between the shedding of blood and this transference of righteousness and the lifting of guilt. This would require a body of flesh and blood, so the incarnation was necessary. Hebrews 10, 5 says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. A body that would have hands that would be pierced with nails. Feet that would be pierced. A crown of thorns would be thrust into his scalp. A sword into his side. He would suffer in that body to take the punishment that you and I deserved for our sins. He truly is acquainted with our sorrows. He's a man that knows suffering. God had to take on the flesh to make the blood sacrifice. That as his blood was poured out, our sins were transferred upon him and his righteousness was imparted to us. All who put their faith and trust in him. Christmas, friends, is a celebration of the fact that Jesus was willing to leave the glory of heaven and humble himself to come here, put on the flesh, take not only all the worldly things that this world could throw at him, but then willingly go to a cross to make that transaction possible for you and I. That gets me in the Christmas spirit every time. Philippians chapter 2 puts it this way. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to it or claim privilege, in other words. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's this unique gift that was given to us that first Christmas so long ago. God sent Jesus as a baby who would grow to be a sinless man who would offer himself to Calvary's cross so that you and I could be considered righteous in the eyes of God. Here's the thing, a gift can be given, but you have to receive it. A gift can be given, and it's available to all today. That's the good news of the gospel. But don't miss this part. We have to receive this gift. Maybe you're here today, and you've been counting on your own goodness because you've got a lot more good than you do bad about you. That won't get it. That won't get it. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice that all of us must come under his blood to be united with the Father for eternity. If you're here and you've never invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, listen, don't wait for next week. Don't, you don't even need to pray about this. It's crystal clear in Scripture. Make Jesus the Lord of your life today. He asks that you repent of your sins, that you, you turn from what you know to be wrong, and you, you commit yourself to following Christ the best you know how. You don't know everything about the Bible at this point. Just keep getting in there and studying it and obeying what he shows you. Repentance is an attitude of the heart. Are you willing to follow after him the best you know? We're a family of believers that want to help you learn the will of God and obey it more fully and completely as you learn. He asks that we identify with him through the act of baptism, that we bury our old nature, our old sinful self. He washes us clean with his mercy and grace and raises up a brand new creation. This Christmas could be a Christmas of a new beginning, a fresh start, and an eternal peace that comes from knowing you belong to him. Let me pray for you today. God, we come today thanking you for the unique gift, born of a virgin, God in the flesh, come to save us from sin. God, I pray that if there's anybody here today that's never opened up their, their heart to receive this gift, that today would be the day of salvation for them. 
Lord, maybe there's somebody that needs to rededicate their life to get back on track. And I pray that they know that there's not condemnation, the spirit of condemnation in this room, but that we are here to root them on and encourage them and pray for them, God. I pray, Father, that there's someone that has a burden, that they'll come before the great high priest who's been tempted and tried in every way that we've been, Lord. And he understands and he sympathizes with us. And he holds out his hands to us and says, come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I want to give you rest. I pray that we'll find relief from burdens today. That we'll be set free in this place as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a decision or want to pray with someone, we'll see you over here. You can come and pray right here today. Let's stand together as we sing.